Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon if you are overseas. And thank you for choosing to attend the talk. My name is Alok Chandra, and I'm the eldest son of the late Professor Satish Chandra, in whose memory our family has instituted this annual memorial lecture on his death anniversary, which is today. He passed away in 2017 at the ripe old age of 95. The first memorial lecture was given live by Professor Irfan Habib in October 2019, uh, and the second by Professor Ramila Thapar in October 2020 online. Of course, we've all had to adapt to a Zoom life. So this third lecture is being given by Manu. After my opening address, I will hand over to Manu for the talk, which would last about 40 minutes. Uh, the session will conclude with my younger brother, Akhil, reading out questions received and for Manu to answer and giving a short word of thanks. Professor Satish Chandra was best known as an authority on medieval Indian history. His PhD dissertation, Parties and Politics at the Mughal Court, used to be recommended reading for candidates aspiring for the UPSC examinations. While his history of medieval India is one of the largest selling school textbooks on the subject. In all, Dad wrote 21 books over his many years. He spent teaching at various universities, starting with Allahabad University, went on to Aligarh Muslim University, Rajasthan University in Jaipur, University of Delhi, and finally the JNU, which he joined in 1970 and from where he retired in 1995. In between, he was the first. He was first the vice chairman, and then the chairman of the University Grants Commission, which has now been reconstituted. Uh, he was there from seventy three to eighty one, which, of course, were fairly momentous years in in our history. After retirement in ninety five, he went on to found the Society for Indian Ocean Studies, now headed by Ambassador Sudhir Devare, and which now has its own building in Ladu Sarai. This the SIOS is essentially a think tank on social and naval matters relating to the Indian Ocean and its littoral states, the states around the perimeter of the Indian Ocean. And it also brings out a respected quarterly journal. I am immensely grateful to Manu for so readily agreeing to deliver this year's lecture. The subject of, is very interesting to a lot of people, both scholars and students, as well as observers and common people. And for me personally, as I was schooled at the Mayo College in Ajmer, which was set up in 1875 for the sons of the royal families of Rajasthan. Um, the topic, rethinking the princely states, I think has emerged from his research done for this, for his recently launched book, False Allies, India's Maharajas in the Age of Ravi Parva. So without further ado, uh, I request Manu to please come and deliver uh, the memorial, third memorial lecture. Thank you, Alok. Oh. That's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a privilege and frankly an honor to be delivering this lecture. Uh, you, of course, have already discussed your father's achievements and his work. Uh, but as a student of history, one of the things you admire about uh, Professor Chandra is the fact that he was somebody who broke down a lot of simplistic answers about, about history. He was somebody who never forgot that history was something that was complex. And in a sense, he complicated a lot of very received wisdom, you know, ideas that were very simplistic ideas that were too easy uh, and, and far too convenient and made us realize that there were layers, there were uh, there was more to the picture than was, than was visible at, at, an e at an easy immediate glance. And I think that is essentially the, the task of any historian to this day, which is to complicate complex make the, the question more complex, ask more questions of a certain uh, historical uh, you know, point or a position that we've heard or studied from before, and to constantly interrogate the past. Which brings me to the, the, the topic of today's lecture, which is about rethinking the Maharajas, because I believe that is they, or the, as a class, as well as a period of history in which they were important and significant political players, uh, they have often been reduced to caricature and stereotype. But if you just complicate the, the, the business a little more, it 
you just ask a few more questions, you start realizing that there was a lot more happening in the princely state. There was a lot that was of deep political, social and cultural importance that was happening under the Maharajas. And that they were not necessarily just these uh, despots on shiny thrones who sat around for 200 years till the British left and did nothing till the Indian state came and, and, and wiped them out. Now, usually speaking of the Maharajas, you know, the stereotypes come to us very easily. All you need to do is look at a tourist brochure in Rajasthan and you'll see pictures of palaces, you'll see pictures of people in colorful clothes, you'll see uh, talk of, you know, old cars and horses and stables and elephants. Uh, you'll hear stories about a Raja who uh, bought a bunch of Rolls Royce cars and turned them into garbage vans. You will hear stories of a Raja who had hundreds of women in his harem and decided that, you know, uh, he was he was so prolific in, in terms of his uh, romantic interests that where the Nizam of Hyderabad was called his exalted highness, this particular Raja was called his exhausted highness because he had so many wives. Uh, so these are the, are the general stories that you hear about the Maharaja. A lot of them are obviously entertaining. They make for, for almost, you know, comical accounts of history. They're very lively. Uh, and by no means is the claim that there weren't eccentric people or there weren't Maharajas who didn't do certain strange things. You know, there, there must have been Rajas who had lots of wives. There must have been Rajas who, uh, you know, drank champagne and, and, and wild away their time. Uh, there must have been Rajas who did all kinds of strange and curious things. But I think it's important to realize that if a stereotype is brought out to sort of represent the sum totality of a class, the sum totality of a political space, then there's a kind of mischief there. And we must sort of peel back the layers a little bit and ask questions as to why is it that the stereotype dominates as opposed to a more serious understanding of that space. For example, royal eccentricities had, had, were not a monopoly that the Maharajas alone had. If you look at uh, even Queen Victoria's son, he was a, a very difficult crown prince for her to deal with, had heaps of mistresses, got into all kinds of awkward situations, but he ended up becoming the king emperor of the, of the British Empire. And we don't necessarily reduce that political phase and that political position of his life and his career to the, the, the things that he did as a young man. So to somebody like Lord Curzon, who was one of the starchiest uh, viceroys that India had, you know, stiff upper lip, fine erect, uh, often very literally because he used to wear an iron brace uh, and, and very sort of proper. You know, he also as a young man spent much of his time tumbling from one bed to the other. He uh, had it in him to play lawn tennis naked once. So eccentricity or just these, these you know, comical elements, they're part of human behavior. And it isn't that the Maharajas alone were, were engaged in, in such activities, which then means, you know, what, how do we start to look at them more seriously? Now, the first thing is that, you know, we think of Maharajas and or, or the princely states in India, and we think of 562 states. That's the usual number that's bandied about. Sometimes it's 700, sometimes it's 565. Uh, there isn't a clear uh, number. One of the reasons there isn't a clear number is that these categories often changed. So you would, uh, you would have a situation where in, in one particular count, certain zamindars were also included in something else, somebody else was not included, and so the numbers kept fluctuating. But even if you take 562 as the number of princely states, the, the constant repetition of, a, of that number, that till the British left, there were 562 princely states in India, that's also got a, a little bit of a conceptual mischief going on there, because what it does is it gives you the impression that you throw a stone in India and you hit a Raja, and that they were, they were, they were a dime a dozen, which meant that they weren't particularly serious, all of them ruling over small territories, all of them tin pot despots doing uh, nothing that was very interesting. But then you sort of interrogate that number and you discover that over 300 of these were actually microscopic estates really, spread over a few square miles of territory, a lot of them concentrated in what we call Kathiawar. So that gets rid of over 300 states from the overall number. You keep investigating the number further still and you discover that the real states, you know, the, the principalities that merit the term state, which means a large population, a large enough revenue of say over 10 lakh rupees uh, per annum, uh, those were only about a hundred, you know, some people 110, 112, but let's say just over a hundred states actually merit the term of a princely state. So that itself breaks away the idea that you throw a stone and you hit a Raja, because in such a large uh, subcontinent, a hundred princes suddenly starts looking more serious as opposed to 562. The other thing is, conceptually, we often describe the princes as being subject to indirect rule. You know, the British ruled uh, what was called British India, 
And of course, these Rajas were just controlled by the British and they were indirectly ruling these princely territories. Again, that term to me is slightly loaded uh, politically and it is loaded with, with some of these, with, with these problems that, that sort of tilt the field against the Rajas. Which is to say that, yes, the Rajas were susceptible to pressures from the British. They were susceptible to, uh, you know, sometimes being toppled. One poor Raja even got beaten to death in the 1880s. Um, it, these things did happen. But overall, the term indirect rule masks another way of looking at it, which is that if you have British ruled India, the rest of it under the Rajas, which is, you know, about, uh, you know, two-fifths of India's subcontinental territory, is under Indian rule. That is Indian ruled India. Yes, the British came as an imperial formation. Yes, the British came and, and sort of took over overlordship of these states. But on the ground, for millions of people who lived in these states, their direct intercourse was with their Raja, not with the white man. The white man wasn't as present in their, in their lives as uh, you know, the Englishman was in British India. It was, it was, that itself tells you that the Rajas were ruling over Indian units through Indian institutions, of course, responding to new pressures and, and, and modernity and so on. But they were essentially Indians governing India, which is why one of the reasons the nationalists of the Congress party till as late as the 1920s uh, saw many Rajas as heroes was precisely because of this. They saw that the princely states had been spared the worst of colonialism. Ultimately, in princely India, it was an Indian ruler with Indian ministers, Indian bureaucrats, all of them governing over Indians. Although under pressure, although squeezed by the Raj, it was still a place where Indians could shine, as opposed to British India. So even the term indirect rule versus, you know, Indian ruled India, there's a little bit of, you know, I think there's a correction that we require, uh, that, that, that needs to be made there. The other thing is, you know, in, in, in Indian ruled India, what, why, why is Indian ruled India important? Partly because the general narrative, because we're, you know, preoccupied with British India, because we're preoccupied with the nationalist struggle, the conversations are often about Indians fighting the British. But what was happening in the states where the British were not directly visible, where anti-colonialism wasn't as big a plank as perhaps certain other things? That's where you discover the importance of casteism, communalism. A lot of the things we still see in our democratic politics in the 21st century, you actually find elements of that in the princely states because they didn't have a common enemy in the form of the white man. This was Indian politicians dealing with the Raja some of the politicians in states like Travancore would, would sort of uh, form their groupings around caste identity. So the Nayas would be one group, the Iravas would be one group, the Christians would be one group, and that's how Travancore politics was organized, not against the British. These were the groups jostling with each other. And it, it's quite funny that to this day, uh, you know, in, in Kerala politics, the Naya Irava element and the Christian element remains very active, and it, there are factions within the Congress party that are still based on these groups. To understand that, you need to actually go back to the princely state of Travancore. You take somewhere like Rajputana, and you think that, oh, you know, the, the Raja has to deal with the British, who are his overlords, and they'll give him orders. And he's sort of sitting there and issuing arbitrary orders, constantly sitting on a silk uh, sofa of sorts and, and issuing whatever he feels. And that's how princely states are run. But no, things were always a bit more complex within the states. The Rajput system, there was the king, there were his vassal lords. The vassal lords always challenged the king's authority. Just as the king had to deal with the British, the vassal lords dealt with the king. And just as the king dealt with pressure from the, from the British, he had to deal with pressure from his courtiers. And it could be quite intense pressure. Uh, as late as the 1930s, you have an armed rebellion uh, set off by a vassal lord of the Maharaja of Jaipur. So these vassals were important political figures in their own right. All the same, you have peasants and, and peasant unrest that often uh, forces the hand of the Raja. You have tribal unrest because the tribal, uh, the bills in Rajputana through the 19th century, uh, you find, and of course, before that also, but through the 19th century in the colonial period, you see them standing up to the Rajas. So the Rajas were never sitting in a position of complete comfort simply because the British protected them. And nor were they in a position to rule arbitrarily and do as they wished. They had various pressures working within, they had various pressures outside, and it was precisely as political that they had to balance these different pressures. And it would vary from state. So in a state like Baroda, for example, you have a Maratha royal family ruling over Gujarati. So the, the fault lines over there are slightly different. In Rajputana, as I said, there are tribals, there are peasants, there are the vassal lords, the fault lines are slightly different. In Kerala, you have an orthodox ruler, uh, but you have an, a community like the Iravas, who are a, a former lower caste, moving up and claiming political clout. Again, the, the issues there are different. 
So each of these states is diverse, each of these states is different, and it tells you a lot about, and it's by putting this together that we can construct a better image of what is modern Indian history. To reduce modern Indian history to, you know, essentially the, what was happening in British India and, and to the process of standing up to the Raj, it sort of eclipses the experience of millions of people, of whole communities, of whole political institutions in the princely states, some of whom have continuities going back a long time. So the Nizam of Hyderabad, for example, had these subordinate Samasthan states, which were ruled by, by Hindu Rajas. Some of them actually trace their genealogy back into the 13th century, into the age of the Kakatiyas. So although the Kakatiyas were their overlords first, then the Sultans of Delhi, then the Bahamani Sultans, then say the Qutub Shah of Golconda, then the Nizam of Hyderabad, down to 1949, those rulers ruled over that same chunk of territory with just these overlords changing. It tells you also about the larger span of Indian history, where between the British and the Indian people, there is this layer of, of Indian authority and Indian power that is, that is extremely important. But leaving that aside, it wasn't as though the Rajas did not stand up to the British either. Uh, you know, one example I can give you is of a gentleman called Tukoji Rao Holkar. He was the Maratha ruler of Indore. Indore was, of course, set up in the 18th century by the Holkar dynasty. Its most famous ruler, whom even the British uh, admired, was Ahilya Bai Holkar. You know, if you read Malcolm's work from the early 19th century, he calls her a model of good government and so on. And for she who set up very high standards of administration in the late 18th century. But Tukujira Holkar and his dealings with the British are quite fascinating. In 1877, there was what was called one of these Delhi Darbars, where the British basically gathered together the Rajas and, and said, you know, you must all come and you know, pay homage to Queen Victoria. She wasn't present in person, but she had just assumed the title of Empress of India. And she had claimed that imperial mantle of the Mughals for herself. And at this Darbar, various Rajas were invited and they were all, and they all came and sort of, you know, uh, declared allegiance to the British. And there's this interesting letter that the Indore Raja writes then, where he says, India has been till now a vast heap of stones, some of them big, some of them small. It was thanks to the British that now the house is built, and from roof to basement, each stone is, it in, a, is in the right place. Which, on the face of it, you would think, oh, you know, he's groveling, what a slavish man, completely... Uh, you know, uh, playing up to the British and fucking up and saying that, oh, you know, without you, India would have just fallen apart and you've come and saved Indians. What's interesting is that despite this letter, which on the face of it suggests complete loyalism, why is it that privately the British described the same Raja, and I'm quoting, as a chief whose disloyalty is notorious and who, who by intriguing in every possible manner presented the Raj with purpose, persistent opposition? That is to say, in public, the Raja has got this oily language that he's using, but in private, he's constantly described as disloyal, which then poses the question, if somebody looks, he's come for the Darbar, he's paying homage to Queen Victoria, he's writing this kind of slavish uh, letter to the Raj, then why is he still considered disloyal? That's where you sort of peel back the layers and you start looking at the Raja seriously, and you discover that in 1857, as a young ruler, uh, of Indore, his army decided to attack the British. The Raja very shrewdly said that, oh, he had lost control of his army, but subsequent research suggests that that's not actually true. In fact, he may have looked the other way quite deliberately while his army took control of his arms and ammunition and went out against the British. So there was that element which was hanging over his head. Um, through the 1860s and 70s, he would fight with the Raja on all kinds of things. Uh, you know, they, they, the British had a, a plan to take over Mysore state and, and, and sort of, you know, kick out the Vadiyas and keep it for themselves. He was lobbying, he was paying money and actually sending people to London and, and canvassing people to help the Mysore family get back the, what was their due. Similarly, the state of Dhar, he was, he was helping its rulers argue the case. And they had actually been deposed because of disloyalty in 1857. He was arguing the case that no, the British do not have a right to remove them from power and the kingdom must be returned to the rulers of Dhar. That was, you know, so he's meddling with things the British don't want him meddling in. You know, the British had this rule that princes are not supposed to have contacts with each other, but in reality, the princes always had contacts with each other, you know, under the under the nose of the British. They had no idea that these, these contacts were taking place, but they were. Similarly, uh, Dada Bhai Nauruji, you know, the, who was one of the earliest Indians to be elected into the House of Commons in London, we often forget, forget that he was originally a divan in a princely state in Baroda. He also saw the princely states as extremely important to articulating a nationalist message, to articulating what, you know, power and freedom and independence and autonomy would mean to Indians. 
And the other binology had set up in London an organization called the East Indian Association, which was basically, uh, you know, you could, if you want to be pejorative, you can say it was like a debating club where people came and just gave grand lectures and speeches and had debates, like a gentleman society. But it was about Indian issues in London, and it did aggravate the British a great deal. If you read Dinyar Patel's biography of, of Dada Bhai Nauruji, you'll see the importance of the East India Association in that time. And Tukoji Rao Holkar made a grand donation once of 25,000 rupees to Dada Bhai Nauruji for his association. Now, in those days, 25,000 rupees was a ton of money. The, the association did not have that kind of funding. And Tukoji was not the only one. There were a lot of other Rajas who were also, also funding Dada Bhai Nauruji's organization. In fact, his election to the House of Commons was also funded by a lot of Rajas because they had an incentive also in having a, a black man or a brown man in London needling the British from there. So they were not meek, they were not submissive. And when Tukoji Rao Holkar made this donation, he actually, in a, in a letter that's written at that time, the Raja secretary, he didn't write it himself, his secretary did. He basically justifies making the, the donation because he thinks the East India Association is in patriotic exertions in, in the UK and he's trying to support that. And he says the East India Association is, is conveying the true picture of India to the British. On the face of it, it doesn't feel like problematic language, but what he's essentially saying is patriotic exertions is language the British don't like. And when he says that the East India Association is making known to the British public the true state of things in India, implicit in it is the idea that the British government is not telling the people in London, uh, the people in the UK, what they're actually up to in India, and that things in India are worse than they might appear from Britain. This was why the British uh, thought of him as a disloyal man. In fact, in the 1870s, he by no means was Tokoji Rao Holkar some kind of ideal ruler. He was an autocrat, but he maintained his finances well. He, he brought in the railways, he set up these cotton mills, etc. So in terms of revenue, because he was in control of his state, the British found it very difficult to interfere. And when they tried, he would fight back. He would, he would, you know, he knew exactly how to push back on pressure that way. And when in the 1870s, he brought a very accomplished Indian native statesman, as they were called in those days, because in those days, statesmen could only be white. So if you were a brown statesman, you were called a native statesman. So he brings in a native statesman called Sir T. Madhav Rao, who's got experience uh, turning around the administration of Travancore in the South. He's a very respected administrator and a hero for Indians, because Madhav Rao proves that uh, you don't need white guidance to rule. You don't need white people to govern. Natives can govern themselves. And the British resident at that time says that, you know, this minister has been brought in not for anything else, but to fight with the British residency. The residency is essentially the, 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 where the British ambassador or the British resident would, would stay in. There would be constant sort of, you know, interaction between the royal government and the, the residency. So even to admit that the Divan or the or Madhav Rao has been brought in to fight with the residency is a very clear sort of, it's, it's a confession or an admission of the fact that by bringing in an established native statesman, by bringing in somebody to modernize your administration, you are very consciously trying to minimize the room you give to the British to come and interfere in your government. So, you know, there's this Tukoji Holkar is merely one example. Now, how exactly did the Rajas resist? It could take all kinds of creative ways. By no means can we argue that the Rajas got on the streets like Gandhiji and had these huge, uh, you know, protest marches and, and street agitation. They did not. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't uh, gloss over that. Ultimately, what won us freedom is that mass galvanization, which is to Gandhiji's credit. But if you look at the overall span of what we call India's colonial experience, it was many layered, had many facets, had many chapters, and many people trying all kinds of different things. And here the Maharajas are, are interesting because, as I said, they not meekly sort of lie back and allow the British to do what they wanted. They actually stood up and fought uh, pressures of the British. And that could happen in creative ways. In the, in, in the state of Gwalior, for example, where in the early 19th century, there was a ruler called Baizabai, a formidable woman, loved riding horses, was quite amused when she met an English woman who used to sit side saddle and she said, and she said, why are you riding in this peculiar way? Ride properly like the Maratha women do. She controlled a, a state till the 1840s. The Gwalior state had a, had a very strong economy. It had a, a lot of money, money coming in from the opium trade and it had 40,000 soldiers. So the British couldn't come and bully the rulers of Gwalior as they would have liked. And ultimately, it was through military action that the Gwalior army was sort of disbanded and the British gained greater control over the state. And that happens only in the 1840s. So Baizabai is very confident of her authority. To begin with, she's actually got so much personal wealth of her own, crores of rupees, that she loans money to the East India Company. So she's already got a certain advantage over them. 
But the other thing is when the British send a resident to her court, this, this ambassador slash representative of theirs, he arrives expecting to be treated as some kind of extraordinary figure. He expects everybody to fall at his feet and be extremely respectful to him. But he arrives and finds that no arrangements have been made for him, not even firewood in his kitchens. It's, all, it's almost as if the Darbar is just ignoring his arrival. And it was done consciously, it was done deliberately in order to send the political message, which is the Rani was saying that, by, and, and uh, this is actually from one of the British records of that time, where the resident himself says that by showing her autonomy, by showing her complete disdain for the English representative, she was making a statement of her own independence. She was making a statement of her own power. Of course, the British eventually conspire with factions at court and she goes into exile. But even in exile, she's not a weak woman. Uh, she moves around with 7,000 people, followers and soldiers. They want her to go and live in Varanasi quietly and she refuses. And instead, after living in various parts of North India, she moves back to the Deccan towards the south, where the British have a very serious fear that she will use her immense financial resources and her, her influence over the Marathas to actually foment uh, revolt and rebellion. And you have this uh, a governor general writing to her saying that, you know, why are you meeting all these anti-British people? Because they seem to have a direct line to Baizadai. And she, of course, played up gender and her age. And she said, oh, I'm such an old woman. Uh, you know, prayers and God are my only interest in life. While she was actually, uh, you know, indeed meeting people the British were very uncomfortable with. And they never wanted her to come back to Gwalior. But she orchestrated a return in due course. She used her fortune to, you know, get a later Raja to permit her to come back and eventually died in the same place that she had had to flee many, many years before. Now, this is in the early 19th century. You know, British rule, we often assume, started with the Battle of Plassey and that was it. But it's not quite true. Plassey was in the 1760s. It took till the late 1840s for the Sikh Empire to fall. So for 100 years, that process of empire building was still, you know, an ongoing process, which meant in the early 19th century, a lot of Rajas had room to maneuver. They had room to negotiate. And by no means were they subservient. Even when they did become, let's say, subordinated to the British, the Nizam of Hyderabad, for example, on the one hand, the British were quite in awe of the Nizam because they saw them as the final remnant of the Mughal Empire. They saw the Nizams as, as, as the most sort of prestigious uh, leaders of the Muslims in India, so much so that when uh, in, in, in World War I, the Ottoman Caliph was, was uh, removed from his position, uh, the British actually wanted the Nizam to come and make a statement asking Indian Muslims to be loyal to the Raj as opposed to uh, feeling aggravated by what was happening with their Khalif. And the Nizam agreed to do it. But of course, later he extracted or he tried to extract something in return. And when that didn't happen, he happily started funding conferences on, on restor restoring the Khalif to power. So the Nizam was an important figure. And they therefore couldn't always bully the Nizam in the way they liked. Sometimes certain people did if the Nizam was weak, but a lot of other Nizams, it was difficult to be so direct and, and blunt. And the Nizams were able to reciprocate through all kinds of interesting you know, strategies. One was ritual. Now we think that ritual is some kind of meaningless thing. You know, These Rajas are so obsessed with ceremonies. They're so obsessed with ritual. They're so obsessed with these frivolous things. But the fact is that if you look at ritual, you realize that that was the platform on which politics was conducted. Ritual was not empty ritual for the sake of ritual. You know, nobody conducts ritual simply because uh, they feel like it. Even today, when we stand up for the national anthem and we sing the anthem in a certain posture and a certain form, it has a meaning to it. It has a certain political substance to it. And this is, the, this is true of the princely states as well. So when the British residents would come and say that, oh, we want to call on the Nizam, but we will wear our shoes in it on entering the Darbar, the Nizam had every right to say, no, you will not, because wearing shoes was, was derogatory to his authority. And for two generations, the British waged war with the Nizam, well, not war, but no, I'm speaking figuratively, but they, they sort of fought with the Nizam to try and get themselves the right to wear shoes in Darbar, and the Nizam wouldn't allow it. And finally, they succeeded only when there was a young Nizam, a little boy, and there was a regent ruling for him. The regent wanted something else from the British, so they came to an agreement, and that's when the British were finally allowed to wear shoes in the Darbar. Um, you know, small details. The British residents often fought with the Rajas across states on where the seat of the British resident would be. Now, the British, on the one hand, make fun of the Rajas, saying so frivolous, caught up in all these little things. But the fact is, the British also played that same game because they were aware that if they did not uh, play this ritual game, they would end up looking demeaned. So, for instance, when the British resident comes and says that my chair must be on the same level as the throne, 
In certain states, that was allowed because of various historical contingencies. But in other states, they would say no, as happened in Travancore in the 1920s, where a resident wanted to know why the chair was not at the same level as the throne. And the then Rani of Travancore said, because A, it's never been there. And secondly, it's derogatory to the throne. Then the residents would fight on the question of which side the, the, the resident's chair should be on. The left side was considered less honorable than the right side. So then they would fight to be on the right side. And of course, the Rajas would insist, no, no, you must stay on the left because your chair has always been there on the left. This, this is not petulant behavior. This is not children fighting. These have political significations. In Rajputana, for example, the Maharana of Udaipur always had this habit of, of, of feigning diplomatic illnesses every time he had to go to Delhi and meet the British. So he would go to Delhi, and then once he got there, you know, for these Delhi Darbars of 1903, 1911, he would then fall ill very conveniently so that he didn't have to participate in the processions that the Raj expected the Rajas to do, which is, you know, they all get on their elephants and they sort of, you know, uh, look exotic and like tropical exhibits and, and flatter the British by coming out in all their diamonds and regalia. And, and Udaipur did not want to do it. And he would feign these illnesses, which again is not a, a case of princely eccentricity. It has political meaning. Why? Because if he does it, firstly, Udaipur always found he was placed behind the Maharaja of Baroda. And as a Rajput, he always found it somewhat offensive to have to stand behind the Maratha. But more importantly, as I said, in the Rajput political structure, the vassals were extremely powerful, had a lot of influence. And if the Raja went to Delhi in an imperial setting and got himself insulted in a ritual context, you know, placed behind a Maratha ruler whom he thought was inferior to him, made to sort of, you know, join in this procession of Rajas when he thought of himself as the Hindu Suraj, as somebody who'd never even bow to Mughals. If he did that, when he returned to his court, his vassals would try and diminish his authority because he had essentially gone and returned with an insult. And that would make him look bad in the ritual dynamics with his subordinates. His subordinates, in turn, would watch their ritual prerogatives very keenly. For instance, the Raja's cushion, how far is the, the subordinate's cushion kept? For certain nobles, the Raja will stand up when they arrive, but also, again, when they depart. For others, he will not stand up when they depart. Some nobles are so important that the Raja is, receives them at the gate or, or, the, or the entrance of the palace as opposed to in the darbar. Even changing minor elements of this. One day the nobleman comes and you decide not to receive him at the gate and to receive, receive him inside. It's an insult. And as I said, it could lead even to armed rebellion. It could lead to other forms of subversion. It could result in the Raja's power being questioned and that whole edifice being challenged. So even ritual was not empty uh, politics. It was actually loaded with meaning. And the British played that game a great deal. You know, they, they were very distressed when they found in the early 1870s that the Maharaja of Gwalior was still print, uh, minting coins uh, with, the, with the, the name of a Mughal emperor as opposed to Queen Victoria. Uh, they, in, 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 I think, Ramnad, they insisted during Navratri festivities, a portrait of Queen Victoria should also appear because it, was a, it wasn't just a religious celebration. It was also political. It had political significance and Victoria's presence there was extremely important. Victoria herself was often sort of Indianized as Victoria Maharani, and that's how she was often called. And there's a lovely old painting of her done by an Indian artist showing her breastfeeding her, her infant daughter. Because even in art, she could be realized in order to appeal to her, to her Indian allies or the, the princes. So even these things often had, uh, you know, political meanings. And the Rajas would fight back on what to you and me may now seem comical, trivial things. For example, the British insisted that only the British royal family was a royal family. All the Indian Rajas were ruling families. And the rulers were not called kings, they were called princes. But repeatedly you find, and repeatedly the British object to it, the actual governments of the Rajas using terms like royal family, using terms uh, like king, using terms like princess, etc., for junior members of their family, which the British did not allow, and completely flouting what British orders were on these subjects. Because for their autonomy, for their self-respect in the eyes of their subjects, for their self-respect in the eyes of their people, they had to stand up to the British. Being submissive, submissive and meek would have undermined their own standing in their core domain. As I said, the British may exert pressure on you, but ultimately you're in control of that government, you're in control of that many people in that territory, which means you have to push back, you have to fight in, 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 in interesting ways to preserve your own turf. And that could happen in, in all kinds of diverse forms. In Travancore, for example, you know, the, the deity was the head of the state, Sri Padmanabha Swami. But then, of course, you have the British coming in, and the British are the actual political overlords of the state. And the Rajas face this conundrum where, on the one hand, their idea of Hindu kingship requires them 
uh, to show conspicuous devotion to the temple, to make donations, to go through these super expensive Hindu rituals like Tula, uh, Tula uh, Bharam, the Hiranyagar pub, all of which involved a lot of money being spent, the beneficiaries of Vipra Brahmin. And with good reason, the British came and said, why are you spending so much money on, on, on these you know, frivolous rituals? Uh, they weren't aware that these are important to kingship, but these are frivolous rituals as far as the British are concerned. So how does the Raja respond? He realizes, and this is by the second half of the 19th century, the Rajas start to realize that the one way to keep the British out of our business is to beat them at their own game. So with hiring a, a, a Sati Madhura, the native statesman of that time, the Raja starts modernizing his administration. He starts building roads, he starts building schools, he starts building uh, tanks and irrigation works. He starts publishing every year in the English language reports about his administration, statistics, numbers. A lot of it is coolly exaggerated because you're only trying to impress the British. It doesn't matter what the reality on the ground is. Although to be fair, again, it wasn't just Rajas who did it. The government of India to this, to this day does it. All governments do it. They sort of make their numbers look better than they actually are. And the Raja started churning out this data on how progressive his government is. And by doing that, by spending a large amount on education, he could also get away spending a large amount on the religious side of his kingship, which required him to make donations and gifts to 15,000 Brahmins. By spending on public works, he could also spend on his temple. And by thus balancing this out, he was able to unite a conservative idea of kingship with a progressive idea of kingship. You see this in Mysore as well, where you know the kings had the Dashara festival, which was not just a religious festival, but a, 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 something that kings did. It's a kingly uh, festival that was done going back all the way to the Vijayanagara Empire. They continued that, but simultaneously, they also started holding an industrial exhibition just to keep the British quiet, which is that, look, simultaneously, we have an old form of kingly power, but also a progressive form of kingly power with industrialization uh, happening on the side. So the Rajas came up with means and techniques by which to counter British pressure. And some of this could be done in very shrewd and interesting ways. So uh, Ram Singh of Jaipur, for example, he picked and chose what, where, where he wanted to modernize and where he didn't want to modernize. So for instance, he would modernize in terms of getting railways, he would modernize in terms of roads, you know, uh, gas lights in his capital, set up a school, set up a college, more than happy to do all of that. But he did not modernize his revenue administration. He did not start putting out English language reports about how much his income was and what the state accounts and their statistics were for the simple reason that he didn't want the British having access to that kind of data. His treaty with the British very clearly said that any revenue above 40 lakh of rupees, uh, the British would get a slice of it. And the Maharaja for years and years and years, by fudging his accounts and by keeping his revenue management backward in quotes, by not modernizing it and by not publishing details, he was able to claim revenues of 39 lakhs when his revenue was close to between 50 and 60 lakhs. He was able to save that much money and prevent the British getting a cut simply by fudging his accounts. And how convenient that it was always under that, that 40 lakh mark. And it was a creative form of resistance. And the thing is, the British were never in enough control to be able to question this or stand up to this. In Jaipur's case, even Ram Singh's successor, in the, in the early 1900s, he made certain donations to uh, some British charities, famine relief, etc. And the British in, a, in an internal record very clearly say that they are very aware of what the Raja is doing, which is to essentially pay them off here in their charities so that they don't start poking their nose in his actual finances, in his actual internal business. So there was subversion happening even at the level of how, what, what kind of information you allow to the British, what kind of ritual politics is allowed, good governance as a means of standing up to British pressure because the British claimed that they were here to civilize India, they were here to teach Indians to govern. But by turning the tables, yes, you're playing by British rules, yes, you're playing by the idea of progress and the importance of building infrastructure and schools, etc. But by owning that process, by excelling at that process, you're reducing the room the British have for direct intervention in your state. That's why you find a lot of Indians in British India also responding to this. Uh, you know, uh, Tilak, for example, his newspaper like the Kesari, every time the British interfered in the Maratha states or in the states in Western India, these nationalist papers of British India would be up in arms because they saw it as an encroachment on the rights of, of Indians. 
you know, people would would have a direct interest in this. As Sardar K. M. Panikkar, for example, wrote how it was the states that created a school of Indian statesmanship. Because in, in British India, you could join the British Indian colonial service, you could speak the English language, but for the longest time, you couldn't be much more than a glorified secretary to a white man. You know, you would be always appointed in a sort of B-level position, never an actual authority. Whereas if you transferred, so like men like uh, Madhav Rao, Sheshaya Shastri, uh, V. Ramayangar, these were people of the 19th century, they would transfer from British service into the service of a princely state and suddenly start thriving because suddenly they would be ministers. They would have complete control over their government. And what is interesting is the same men who in the British service would be fairly loyalist in their language. The moment they shifted to the Raja's service, they would start standing up to the British. So for instance, in Travancore, Shesha Shastri found the British were very uncomfortable with allowing the Travancore Raja's judges to try white uh, prisoners and, and criminals. And he actually fought. He didn't succeed because ultimately the British had more power. But the same man who had come out of the British bureaucracy, after switching to, princely, uh, to a princely master, was able to stand up. When the British came and said, oh, you know, your government is spending disproportionately on temples, he was able to dig up records from earlier in the century and say that actually the income the state derives from temple lands, which are under the state's control, is far higher than the amount of money we're spending on this. He was able to stand up to, he was even able to write rather blunt letters uh, in which he denounced British policy on even in British India, where they wouldn't allow Indian judges to try white uh, white criminals. And it was possible for them to do that because the Rajas gave them support and the Rajas gave them platforms by which uh, they could succeed. So in a state like Pudukota in Tamil Nadu, when in the 1870s, the Raja had a complete mess at his hands. He was not a capable ruler, a weak ruler. Uh, did not have a suitable administrative system, terrible revenues, personal debts, complete nightmare of a situation. And there's a letter where Sati Madhav Rao, the native statesman, writes to Sheshaya Shastri, who's just retired from Travancore, and he says, we are natives, and as natives, we cannot but be interested in the welfare and the preservation of the princely states. And this princely state is suffering. This is like a sick patient, and you, Mr. Shastri, are like a doctor. You have experience. Please go and save the state. Because if we Indians in British India do not go and help the Rajas in princely India, the British will come in and take over. They'll come in and assume complete control of the government. To avoid that, it is a duty as Indians to actually step in and, and, and play that political role. And Shri Shastri agrees. It's a step down for him. The salary is pretty low. But he agrees because he sees there's a certain principle that matters. There's a certain patriotic principle uh, that is in play. You find Rajas uh, standing up to the British sometimes by using their own legal terminologies and by blending the best of local Indian tradition with what modern world offered. So Krishna Rajavadi the third of Mysore, you know, he was installed in power by the British as a five-year-old in 1799, and he dies only in 1868. So he's there all the way from the end of the 18th century to like through a good chunk of the 19th century. And he comes to power. In 1830, he's, he's removed from power after 20 years odd on the throne for misgovernment. And this term misgovernment was used a great deal in the princely states to give the impression that the Rajas didn't know how to rule. But here again, this is why earlier I had mentioned that the internal politics of the princely states also matters because Krishna Rajavadiya ruled over a system where he was the king. Uh, the bureaucracy in his state was controlled by Deshastha Brahmins who originally came from Maharashtra. And they had formed a huge vested interest in the bureaucracy. And they often played uh, along with the British president to reduce the power of the Raja. So the Raja faces pressure, not just from the British, but also from his own bureaucracy, which wants to keep him in check to protect its own turf. And, there are, and, the, and the bureaucracy and the British led along. All the same, he also has subjects who are Lingayats and Vokaligas, two important groups that are still important to uh, Karnataka politics. And the Veera Shaivas have a history of rebellion against the Vadiyas. So what happens is that as the Raja tries to, Raja of course reduces the influence of the British resident, and the British resident is very angry about it. The Raja systematically tries to cut down the influence of the Marathi Brahmin bureaucrats in his government. And by the 1820s, we have a situation where the Marathi Brahmins, the Marathi Brahmins, they realize that there's also economic depression going on. So peasants, Virashaiva peasants in a certain area are not uh, very happy with the royal government. They instigate a revolt to put pressure on the Raja. The revolt gets a little out of hand. The British have to move in and they topple the Raja for misgovernment. Now, what's interesting here is that it is both internal dynamics, it is peasant resistance, it is uh, you know, shrewd politics of an entrenched bureaucracy, all of it that comes together in that term misgovernment. 
In fact, soon after Krishna Javadia was toppled, the same governor general who toppled him admitted that it was hasty action, admitted that if there was some financial trouble, it was because of a general economic depression in South India, not because the Raja was bad. And they eventually realized that they had actually treated the, bad, the Raja poorly. Now, of course, the thing with the British is once they've taken something from you, it's very difficult to actually get it back from them. So the Raja actually waged a war of petitions and, and, and legal documents for the next very many decades. 1831, he's removed from power. This is going on all the way to the 1860s. And the British at first say, yes, we've assumed your, your administration temporarily. We will eventually return it to you. Over time, however, uh, by the 1850s, they start thinking, actually, why should we return it? Let the Raja die. He doesn't have an heir. So we'll just take over the state. Till then, we'll keep paying him an allowance, and that's about it. Krishna Rajavadiyar, however, has two ways of responding to it. One is there's this wonderful book called Devotional uh, uh, Sovereignty by, by Caleb Simmons, which you should read, because it talks about how Krishna Rajavadiyar, he was aware that he no longer controlled government. He did not control land and, and physical resources of that nature. Yet as a king, he had to stay relevant and retain the loyalty of his subjects. So what did he do? He moved kingship into the realm of religion and spirituality. Grand donations to temples, having images of his circulated. So the Veera Shaivas had rebelled against him. So paintings of him are done where he's actually wearing the, the Lingayat Ishta Lingam. He's actually sitting in the pose of a Lingayat himself. And he tries to build cultural bridges there. He uses his vast financial resource to patronize poets, you know, scholars, Sanskrit experts, etc in order to retain that patronage, that kind of influence that will allow him to have some kind of relevance to local society. Simultaneously, so on the one hand, he's for one Indian audience, he's got this devotional kingship, this devotional idea of the king, the spiritual idea of the king. The other side, he's also waging this legal war. And he's telling the British that I will also be a legal king. I will now start having these modern institutions. I will now start running my administration in a new format, but return my kingdom to me. They refuse. And eventually, this, this goes all the way to London. And the Raja wins over the head of the British bureaucracy in India because he lobbies people in London and essentially shames people in Parliament into admitting that what was being done to him was unjust. It had been admitted decades before that he should not have been toppled. And, 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 and pressures put in the British Parliament. Uh, you know, uh, petitions are submitted by Max Mueller, J.S. Stewart, uh, some very important intellectuals of that time in the Raja's favour. And it is the British Parliament, that, or the, or the British government in London, after an election happens and a new government comes in, they are the ones who agree that, yes, Mysore must be returned to the Vadiyas. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this idea of, you know, assuming the state once the Raja dies, we're not going to do it. The Raja and the Vadiyas are going to come back to power. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, there's this line that the Raja, one of his legal advisors uses, where he says, truth is always truth, whether on the bank of the Thames or whether uh, on the bank of the Ganges or the Ganga in India. Because the Raja essentially scored a moral point over the British establishment in India. The entire colonial establishment in India said he was misgoverning, he was good for nothing, uh, he had lost his chance, the British were going to take over. And he was able to gain one step, go one step higher than them on a moral count by exposing their injustice, by exposing the fact that they were purely there, not because he had done anything wrong, not because of uh, anything that to do with justice, they were there simply because they had Mysore, they had its resources, and they didn't want to let go of it. He was able to expose that and win back uh, his government. So that's, you know, one example of, of the Raja's fighting back. Another is, of course, the famous Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda. His, his resistance to the British was far more blunt. It was not necessarily waged through, pet through petitions. It was not necessarily waged through legal battles, but quite directly. In his case, he was picked up as a 12-year-old boy when the previous uh, Maharaja of Baroda was deposed in the name of, of misgovernment. This young boy is picked up. Of course, there's an older claimant for the throne, but the British don't want an older claimant. They are not keen on a grown man because a grown man will stand up to them. So they think, let's bring in a child, a distant relative, because the child is more malleable. He can be, he can be trained to be a good ruler, which is essentially code for saying he can be trained to be loyal and submissive to the British. And for years, Sayaji Rao Gaikwad goes through this interesting educational process where you have Sir T. Madhav Rao, the native statesman I always have mentioned before, who's trying to teach him and give him lessons on how to be not a fully constitutional ruler, but a, a benevolent despot, you know, to care about the people, to have a progressive government. Then you have an English tutor who's giving him a different set of lectures and exposing him to certain Western ideas. Then you have the British resident who's trying to sort of make sure this chap grows up and is perfectly loyal. And... Through those years of training, Sayaji Rao Gaikwad doesn't seem to resist much. He goes through the, the process quite quietly. 
But then in 1881, when his installation comes close, the British say, okay, fine, we're going to give you your powers. You're a grown man now. Uh, but there are going to be, because you, know, you have no experience ruling so far, there are going to be certain uh, limitations on your power for some time. And Sayajir Rao Gaikwad, who was tutored and trained to be this very loyal, submissive ruler, essentially says, that's fine. I understand that you know, I'm not experienced. I, I'm happy to live with the, the limitations, but I need a timeline. The British come back saying, oh, no, no, no need. Whenever you feel we can eventually withdraw these restrictions on your power. He says, no, I want a very clear, fixed deadline on when my power is going to be. Uh, is, is, I'm going to have full power with all these stipulations removed. And it's interesting, if you look at the internal correspondence of that time, the British, just before are praising him for how intelligent he is, how wonderful he is, and how he's been trained and tutored so well. The moment the boy, even on the eve of his installation, shows that he has a spine, the language changes. They start saying, oh, he's a boy we picked up and put on the throne. We are the ones who made him a Raja. And he's already getting ideas of this nature. More importantly, they realize that he's in touch with Tukoji Rao Holkar, who I mentioned earlier in this, in this discussion. And Tukoji Rao Holkar was you know, clearly influencing him to stand up to the British. Again, officially, the, the princes are not supposed to have contacts with each other. But under the radar, obviously, there's connections happening. As time passes, uh, the British get more and more frustrated with Baroda because on the one hand, Maharaja is running an excellent administration. You know, he's, he eventually sets up a representative assembly, uh, plans to set up a university, though that doesn't happen, sets up a bank, compulsory education. Of course, that also didn't fully pan out because a lot of lower caste kids do not actually enter the schools. But the principle, uh, by, by doing it at a time when the British had actually rejected the idea, he was making a statement. He sets up industrial works and factories, etc. So there's a lot of good things happening in his government and his finances are perfectly fine. There's no debt, there's no uh, negative uh, that you can say about his government. So the British have uh, little space to attack him on any of these grounds. So then they start saying that, oh, he's only successfully running an administration because he's actually a man of mediocre intellect. He's just lucky because of the people he appoints to power. Maybe true, but by appointing R.C. Dutt, a Congress president, by getting his speeches written by Aurobindo, uh, who was a revolutionary turned spiritual guru, he was not, and by, by you know, interacting with uh, people like Phule, Jyotiba Phule, Gokhale, Tilak, all kinds of MG Ranade, you know, people of that nature who were called seditionists, you know, uh, the, these were the, the Puna Brahmins that the British called them, uh, were known to be anti-British. And by directly engaged with the, engaging with them, the Raja was, again, not just making a statement, but also drawing certain intellectual inspirations and ideas. And the British started getting more and more angsty about this. They start seeing the Raja, and you start seeing the word disloyal appearing in the context of the Raja within less than a decade of his time on the throne. But you can't do anything because he's running a successful administration. Um, he eventually uh, you know, gets into trouble in 1911. He goes on for a long time. You know, The British have told all the Rajas, you can't support the Congress party. Of course, behind the scenes, the Rajas are supporting the Congress party. In 1887, you know, the Rajas are told not to give funding to the Congress. 1900 or 1901, when Lord Curzon interrogates the Maharaja of Baroda, Sayaj Rao, uh, it turns out Sayaj Rao still been giving. Sayaj Rao was one of the Maharajas who donated to Dadabai Nauroji's election campaign in London. When he traveled abroad, he meets revolutionaries like Madam Kama, Shamji Krishnavarma. Uh, the Savarkar brothers have a link uh, to his palace, and they were, you know, in that revolutionary phase of the early 1900s. So the British are getting more and more worried about not just the fact that the Raja doesn't seem to care a hoot about what they think but that he's actually placing his prestige, he's placing his financial resources at the disposal of patently anti-British uh, forces. So at one point, the British raid Baroda and they discover in, in two areas and they discover these printing presses where a lot of anti-British propaganda is being printed. One of them is, is some kind of a bomb making manual that's I think, um, you know, uh, camouflaged under this very innocent title of vegetable medicine. And when they actually pull up the Raja's government and say, you know, how dare you publish this kind of uh, anti-British propaganda here, this contraband. The Raja's government doesn't answer that question. They actually ask a legal point first, which is, on whose authority have you raided Baroda territory? Baroda is a princely state. Without the Maharaja's permission, your Bombay police has no right to enter Baroda. So the British get very aggravated because they think they found the Raja's government with a smoking gun. Whereas in reality, the Raja is talking jurisdiction and saying, leave the gun for now. Let's talk jurisdiction first. So that's one element. Then they find that of 167 proscribed and banned publications in India, some 17 have emerged just from Baroda, this one princely state. As I said, whenever the Raja travels, he seems to be mingling with the wrong sort. And there's a time when the British, when revolutionary stuff is picking up in the, in the 1900s, the British actually have this, uh, this moment 
but they want the Raja to give a speech, uh, you know, sort of saying that revolutionary activities are bad and violence will not be answered to anything. And the Raja gives the speech, but he also adds that the core problem must be addressed. Now, the core problem is what? British rule and the fact that people are dissatisfied. So again, the British are not pleased. And I think one of the worst was when the Viceroy himself came to Baroda. On the way, he survived an assassination attempt. And yet, when he, came, when he came to Baroda, he saw graffiti. I mean, he heard of graffiti on the walls which said, you may bring all the armies and soldiers you like, but that will not dissuade us from our cause. So this is happening. On the face of it, Baroda Maharaja is one of the top five princes of India, a loyal ally of Suraj. You know, when he goes to London, he meets the British king, Queen Victoria, you know, when he was younger. All of that is happening. He was even tutored and trained by the British to be loyal. But in actual practice, he proves to be completely against the British. Of course, in 1911, they finally have him uh, where they want him. At, 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 a, at the Delhi Darbar of 1911, he's accused of insulting the British king, which is by walking up and showing and turning around and showing the king his back instead of bowing seven times and then you know retreating without showing your back. The fact is other rulers also did it. But there was this huge press campaign specifically targeting Baroda, specifically attacking and vilifying him, which was essentially it was creating a mood to justify his deposition. That is when Sayajira Gaikwad finally tones down his language a little bit. After that, he realizes that, you know, ultimately standing up to the British is important, but uh, you can't do much if you've been pushed off the throne. So he realizes that, let me at least keep my throne. And for the next, uh, the second phase of his career, he doesn't directly, bluntly say things, uh, but he finds other ways of getting his message across, other ways of supporting the Indian nationalists, etc., which is to get his officials to say it, to get his divan to write a letter complaining about uh, interference by the British. He finds other techniques by which to stand up to the British. And I know we're running out of time, but, and because we're sitting on, uh, this is hosted in Bangalore, I think I'll end with the example of Mysore, which is that the Mysore Rajas, again, you know, we saw Krishna Javadiyar and his legal form of resistance. We saw uh, Sayajirao Gaikwad and his very direct uh, form of resisting the British. But in Mysore, there was this other form of also standing up to the British and making a statement, which was a form of economic nationalism. You know, the Rajas, once after Krishna Raja's great uh, legal battles, the state was finally returned to the Vardyas in 1881 through his adopted heir. And this Raja realized, you know, that firstly, the British had just taken away the state. So the Rajas couldn't get as adventurous as they could, as Sayajirao Gaikwad in Baroda could, for example. So the Rajas came up with a brand of economic nationalism that was focused on industrialization. Why? Because in states like Travancore, etc., the Rajas had already shown that Indian Rajas could also put up roads, schools, and run good, healthy, financially strong governments. But Mysore wanted to go one step further. They wanted to make a point in the realm of industrialization because, again, natives are not supposed to have been good at science. They were not supposed to be good at technology. They needed guidance. So by supporting the Indian Institute of Science, by setting up iron and steel works, by setting up one of the biggest dams in the world, the Rajas were making a kind of political statement. And the political statement struck in the sense that even Gandhiji, who was no great friend of machines, actually, in, in, I think in one of his um, uh, you know, Young India writings, he talks about how what Mysore's industrial experiments do make a political point. They are important in showing that natives are also capable of having that scientific spirit. The Mysore government pumped money into the, these projects, like the iron and steel works, for years and years and years and years, it did not turn a profit. It was a, it was a white elephant that was into which a huge chunk of the state's uh, resources were being sunk. It was, you know, there was a lot of loans being taken, etc. But the, the Maharaja's point was never profit. The point was never about turning a profit and making money. The point was a political point. It was about making a statement. By the 1940s, in fact, the Mysore government was considering a proposal. It didn't go through, uh, but the Mysore government was considering a proposal where they wanted to set up an automobile manufacturing uh, unit in, in Mysore, which is to say a princely state in India setting up a car manufacturing unit, unheard of and extremely ambitious. But And, and these were things that the British did not like because they did not like the, the Rajas uh, excelling at, at you know things like this. Now, on the face of it, again, Mysore Raja has his dashara, sits on elephants, dresses in a traditional way, but he's also running a regime that is obsessed with industrialization. That has other consequences, of course. The huge funneling of resources from, let's say, village activities and health and other areas that desperately need them into this technocratic dream of setting up uh, big industries in Mysore. It leads to other social complications. It leads to political turmoil, etc., but Mysore is held up as the great image of native capacity, so much so that the same Sardar Patel, who in 1949 integrates the Indian princely states, says that they're essentially like ulcers in India. 
In 1929, in a speech in Mysore, he actually says that the rulers of Mysore have done an excellent job. And if a certain congressmen in Mysore were agitated, and he basically told them, if you're still dissatisfied, the problem is probably with you, not with the ruler. Uh, Gandhiji, till the mid 1930s, Gandhiji, uh, you know, was writing that you know interfering the princely states is like interfering in Afghanistan or Sri Lanka. The Congress should not go there. He had regard and respect for a lot of rulers. The Maharani of, of Travancore, he compared her to Lakshmi and said her simplicity was, she was even more simple than he was. Maharaj of Mysore, he called her Raja Rishi and compared Mysore to Ram Raja. As late as the 1930s, the princes were seen as respectable figures. The princes had an incentive in supporting the nationalists. States like Mysore, etc., completely basked in the glory of the praise that the Congress party was, was giving them because it, it gave them legitimacy. It gave them a certain kind of aura in the eyes of their own countrymen. <clears throat> What changes, and this is the final chapter of, uh, of, you know, uh, of British rule in India, is that by the mid 1930s, uh, the dynamics change. There's, of course, uh, the British have given the Rajas a seat at the table. They're part of the round table conferences. India, the, the British are designing what they call a federation in which the princely states also have a place. The nationalists are also willing at that time to allow, not all nationalists, Nehru and the socialist flank, perhaps not, but the others were still willing to, to speak to the Rajas and see them as legitimate factors at the table. In 1935, the British start allowing Congress and other parties in India a share of power. So by the 1937 elections in that year, you find Congress governments in the provinces holding ministries, holding important positions, and starting to participate in a form of democratic government in the country. This is where people in the princely states also start coming up with similar demands. And now the Rajas sort of hesitate because obviously, the, the Raja does not want to give up all of his power. They have legislative councils and representative assemblies, but these are always slightly, you know, uh, they don't have, have that much power. And the Raja doesn't want to clip his own wings. So the Raja starts resisting this. More importantly, local politicians who've been fighting elections on the basis of fighting local politics on the basis of communalism, caste, religious issues, locally, they start realizing that one way to pressure the Raja and punch above their weight is to associate with the Congress. The Congress of the late 1930s has no footprint in the princely states. To construct a footprint in the princely states, they need the local politicians. So the two come together. One gets the prestige and the umbrella of the Congress. The other gets representation in the princely states. And they come together. And the Rajas are completely befuddled. Till yesterday, you're financing the Congress and enjoying praise from the Congress. Suddenly, you're getting criticism. And your politicians, who you're trying to control, have joined up with the Congress. So now the Rajas start becoming more and more repressive, whether it's Mysore, whether it's Travancore, or a, a bunch of other states in North India as well. Now they start becoming more and more violent. Now they start becoming more and more autocratic. And the image of them as benevolent rulers who represent the native capacity to govern is replaced. The idea of them as anachronism who do not have a place in future India, in post-colonial India, and who, do know, who, who are resisting the, the march of democracy and modern ideas. Then, of course, um, the Federation negotiations, negotiations fail. World War II comes. That alters things globally. So the Rajas and their, their, their capacity to negotiate is reduced. And by 1947, the, both the British and the Congress have far bigger things to worry about. One is partition, the Muslim League, huge issues. And the demands of the Rajas start looking more and more petty and small. And the Rajas, of course, they also, you know, they have a congenital problem in lobbying together. None of them get, gets along with each other. As I said, Rajput will not sit with the Maratha. The Nizam will not sit with a, a, a junior Nawab. All of them think that they are distinct and special and have their own unique identities. So by failing to band together, uh, they essentially lose uh, momentum. They lose the, the initiative over there. And in the end, the same Sardar Patel, who used to praise some of the big Rajas, uh, sits over their heads with a carrot in one hand and a stick in the other. And most Rajas sign off their rights. But, uh, you know, they retain influence. We often think of the privy persons as just these little bribes that were given to the Rajas to sort of get them to sign on the dotted line. No, I think it's important to recognize the privy persons as an acknowledgement that the Rajas had political status, they had political legitimacy. A lot of people admired and respected them. Their subjects, in many cases, uh, loved them and, and sort of were loyal to them. Giving them that money, allowing them to retain those privileges, they were actually a good bargain for the Indian state because it purchased the accession of these states. It purchased the unification of the country for actually a relatively small price. And of course, the abrogation of the privy purses, although it was, you know, uh, Indira Gandhi's socialist turn may have had something to do with it, it may also have been uh, the fact that the, the Rajas were using money they were getting from the government of India, which Indira Gandhi thought was Indira Gandhi, 
uh, and using that money to support opposition parties and to support non-socialist parties, et cetera, which aggravated Mr. Gandhi. So in a sense, just as they used their resources when they were rulers to sort of, you know, needle the British from behind, after independence, they seem to be doing that to the to, to Mrs. Gandhi and the Congress party, and the privy purses were abolished. Of course, I won't I won't go into that. I think I've already spoken for far longer than I intended, but the overall uh, argument really, including of my, my book, False Allies, which released recently, is this, which is that the Rajas were political figures, they had political personalities, they were not chumptas sitting around in silks and uh, watching dancing girls all day long. There were multiple strategies by which colonialism was resisted in, the, in, in our country. It was not street agitation in the final phase is the big chunk, but the previous 60, 70 years, they are by no means insignificant. The overlaps between Congress and the Rajas, nationalists and the Rajas, intellectuals in British India and the Rajas, all of this is also part of our history during the colonial period. And if we are to make, a, 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 obtain a complete picture of modern Indian history, we must look beyond the caricatures, we must look beyond the stereotypes and take the princely states seriously, because only then uh, by ignoring 40% of the country that was ruled by the Rajas and making the narrative purely about the 60% under British rule, we're also cutting away 40% of our own history and 40% of some very, very interesting stories that tell us about nationalism, imperialism, our past, our identity, and in many cases, even present day politics. So thank you, and I'll stop with that. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manu. That was uh, very interesting uh, insights uh, into your topic. Uh, we do have uh, a number of questions, uh, and uh, I'll just read them out for you, uh, Manu. Uh, so uh, the first question we have is from uh, Nivedita Raju, uh, who's saying, uh, why did you decide to call the latest book False Allies? I'm reading it right now and find it is only the Maharaja of Baroda who actually defied the British in some ways. The Travancore Maharajas actually did, uh, did not actually confront them, or is there something I'm missing? So the thing is, we assume that confrontation can take only one form, right? But in reality, uh, these, were, these are complex negotiations. The fact is that the British have more power than you, which means that the landscape and the playing field is already tilted. You're already playing with somebody who's far bigger than you. So your means of resistance will not necessarily be uh, similar. Each each situation is is different. Rajput Rajas, you know, the Fateh Singh of Udaipur, for example, used his Rajput aura to stand up to the British in a way that, and it, when you get to the Rajputana chapter, you see that the British were in awe of him. They they would often they knew he was a backward rule. But they were for the longest time they did not have the courage to take him head on. Even Lord Curzon, who used to sit and lecture princes uh, with, the, with the Marana of Udaipur, he was extremely polite, extremely cautious in his wording and language because the man was so impressive that you could not sit and presume that you could lecture him. And the British, because of Rajputana's location, its importance for geopolitical uh, security of the empire itself, they didn't want to annoy the Rajputs by, by insulting their, their most important ruler. In Travancore, the situation is different. The Travancore rulers faced, uh, firstly, they're coastal. They had given up their armies long before. If, if Gwalior gave up its armies only in the 1840s, Travancore gave it up in the 1810s, or actually eight, early 1800s. Uh, that by, by then, their armies were disbanded. So Travancore's influence in hard power was very low. So the Rajas had to find ways of standing up to the British, which was subtle and not necessarily very obvious. How did the British interfere for a good 20, 30 years in the state by saying the Rajas did not know how to govern? by standing up and by acing the process of government, by setting up and, and claiming the tag of model state, model state meant the progressive and forward looking state, uh, they were able to reduce the kind of influence that the British had. And they cultivated, it was in Travancore that Sati Madhurao became the native statesman that he became, and then moved on to Indore and then moved on to Baroda and at one point lobbied even for Mysore. It was in Travancore that other, other you know, uh, statesmen of this type who would then go on and help other princely states a lot of them were trained in Travancore state. Madhav Rao's son ended up becoming the one of Mysore. Uh, you know, Sheshaya Shastri's family in Pudukotai. All of these are just so Travancore by setting up that infrastructure in an early phase by the by the second by the 1860s. Uh, it, it was also making a statement. Travancore was. It may not be obvious. It may not be direct. It may not be uh, very glamorous. But I think it was also a means of 
of fighting the British stereotype that Indian rulers could not rule. By ruling well, you already punctured that stereotype and you made a point. Uh, thanks, Manu. Uh, Manu, we've got two more questions which are actually linked uh, maybe directly to Princey States. Uh, one is uh, a question from uh, Kirit Yagnik, who says, would you like to elucidate the term Princey States? And uh, we've also got uh, a question from Sumanth Bhomek, uh, who's saying that though not a Princey State, have you assessed the role of Darbhanga as an ally and also supporter of the freedom movement? No, I haven't gone to Darbhanga. The thing is, you know, there are so many states to study. And, you know, even if you take the 100 most serious ones, that's a lot, frankly. And the one thing I've realized is that there are, there's so much diversity in these states internally that you really can't generalize too much. You know, you really have to go into each state uh, in a certain, with a certain amount of depth and, and focus in order to understand the internal dynamics and then frame how it behaves in its dealings with the Raj. So I've, in my book, for example, I've only taken five states, uh, you know, uh, two of them, in, three in Southern India, one in Western India and one in North India. That's how I've broken it up. Um, the first part of the question was on the term princely state. Now that's the thing, right? For the longest time, in fact, till the end of the 19th century, even the British did not have any standard terminologies for this. You know, they would, um, they would only refer to the Mughal emperor as his majesty. All the other rulers were referred to as princes, but they were sometimes described as kingdoms. They were sometimes you, terms were used that suggested there was autonomy and they were independent forces. What happens by the late 19th century is that the British have become very confident of their imperial power. And they start saying, no, we can't allow them to use terms like kingdom and royal family. Uh, the ruler is a prince and the state is therefore a princely state. It cannot be called a kingdom. It cannot be called anything else. It is a princely state. So that term itself has a political connotation, which is to say, the kingdom or the empire is of the British, and these were princes who were subordinate figures in the empire ruling over princely states. And as I said, the, the Rajas and their ministers often pushed back. If the British did not call them princes in their own internal publications, they would cheerfully call themselves kings and kingdoms and royal families and all that, uh, flouting orders that the British sent from, from Calcutta and Delhi frequently. All right. Um... There, there are a number of questions from uh, Aditya Shankar. Uh, I think we'll uh, let me pick up uh, the last question he's put in. Uh, this is regarding uh, the British rule. So he's saying in the context of British rule of the subcontinent, do you think that the Hindu nationalist uh, nationalists mirrored colonial claims and held up the native princely states as, as exemplars of tradition, as territories unspoiled by foreign hands and thus representative of the true India? They did not uh, there have is, Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yep. Uh, there is also a notion that the concept of Akhand Hindustan of Lake Bharat originated from the courts of one of the princely states. What is your view on this? So a good person to read on this is Manu Bhagwan, who's actually studied the links between the Hindu Mahasabha and Savarkar, etc., with the princely states. But the, the idea of the princely states being held up as exemplars of native governance and native capacity to rule, that didn't originally come from the, the Hindu organizations. It came from the Congress party and founders of the Congress party. They were the ones who, who, who put out that argument in the first place. It, as I said in the, in the lecture, in the 1930s, the equation changes. Congress and the Rajas become enemies. It is at this juncture that you find the Hindu Mahasabha sort of latching on. The Rajas also helping the, the, the Hindu Mahasabha and other affiliated organizations because they've lost sympathy with the Congress. So they need allies in British India as well. Earlier, they and the Congress were allies. Now they pick up on this other element, which is anti-Congress, because they feel that, you know, that it's all a negotiation process, right? It's all about finding influence. It's all about finding people through whom you can further your own agenda. And at that point, the Hindu Mahasabha came in handy and the Hindu Mahasabha also reciprocated and treated the Raja as well. In fact, uh, there was this curious little essay that Savarkar wrote somewhere in the early 1940s. In some journalist question, Gandhiji had said that to keep India united, he would even accept the Nizam of Hyderabad as the emperor just to keep the subcontinent in one piece. Uh, so I have a Muslim emperor of India. Uh, but, and Savarkar wrote this very curious essay in which he said, why the Nizam? No, the princely armies will all come out. The, the forces of Hindudom will come out and they will join forces with the king of Nepal who will descend from the Himalayas and the king of Nepal will become the emperor of India. So clearly there were some dreams, even if completely improbable, by which the princely states would become pillars of some kind of new Hindu Rashtra in the 1940s. But yeah, but that, that connection between the Mahasabha and the princes to a great extent comes in the 30s and 40s by which time they fall out, the princes have fallen out with the Congress. Uh, read Manu Bhagwan, he's, he's a good authority on this. 
Right. Uh, I'll turn this over to Alok in case uh, Alok would like to uh, pick a couple of questions here. Uh, you're on mute, Alok. Uh, I said that I think uh, we've run out of time way beyond what had been allotted. So uh, just uh, take it from here. There are, of course, many questions and people have come in. Uh, right back to you so yeah I, I i think we are we are pretty much uh, out of time so i would uh, really like to uh, uh, propose a vote of thanks uh, and uh, bringing the session to a close uh, i'd like to say it's very much an honor and privilege uh, to propose this vote of thanks on the occasion of the third professor satish chandra memorial lecture and on behalf of uh, professor satish chandra's uh, family uh, and friends uh, who are part of this audience, as well as many colleagues and interested parties. Uh, I really, I'd like to extend a very big thanks to you, Manu, uh, for a very enlightening and gripping lecture uh, on this very topic of rethinking the princely states, uh, especially on the topic of British imperialism and India's native rulers. Uh, it's been uh, really a very, very fascinating and, and gripping topic, which uh, you are an immense bank of knowledge of. Uh, and I think just the uh, entire point uh, that you are making about the characterization and uh, the focus on the eccentricities of the Maharajas uh, to the detriment of uh, the much more nuanced and uh, layered role that they play uh, in both actively uh, and, and uh, you know, passively and everything in between, uh, uh, sort of uh, resisting the British is, is certainly, which is, uh, is, is, is a great insight for the audience and uh, uh, definitely a part of our recent history uh, that we uh, can all very much relate to and uh, which we are all uh, you know enlightened by uh, as as we look at the nuances and, and understand and specifically some of the kingdoms that you have bought out whether it is baroda or rajputana uh, or travancore or mysore i think they're all uh, very very fascinating uh, subjects to uh, to discuss and understand so thank you very much uh, for uh, for your uh, views and for taking us through this very interesting topic. Uh, I would like to, uh, of course, uh, propose uh, a, a big thanks, uh, not only to the audience who are here, but uh, to the Bangalore International Center, particularly Mr. Ravi Chandra, uh, as well as Dekha and the organizing team who've done a fantastic job without which we would not have been able to put together this event. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, a big thanks also to my elder brother, Alok, uh, who has been really working tirelessly. I think it's all uh, his uh, uh, phenomenal organization efforts and connections, uh, which uh, due to which we are seeing the third Professor Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture. So with that, I'd like to close the session and uh, say a very big thank you to everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you thank and a good you. evening all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Hi.